how, how was your um, experience of, of dental school um, at, at, at King's? Um, what's it like? Yeah, I, I loved, I loved, the, I loved it to be honest. I, I feel like a lot of people, even if you do work experience, I don't think you can appreciate how great and how fun dentistry can be until you actually sit down in the chair with the drill in your hand and you get to work on something because mm -hmm. it, it's almost like any, I guess it's like almost any piece of art or, or art piece that you create. You almost feel like this is my work and like you take pride in it. Even if it's not very good, you just think, right, there's, there's scope for me here to, to improve this and make it even better. And it, and it becomes almost a challenge and, and like a competitive environment against yourself where you're like, right, this is the first time I've done a filling. It wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best. I could do so much better next time. And every time you do that, you're like critiquing, you're thinking, right, that was much better than last time, but could be better. And then you have the patient on the end of it who also generally are so lovely and so complimentary, given that you're a student. You know, they're like, I can't believe a student is this good. Or I can't believe, you know, you know, I go to dentists all the time and they're so scary or whatever. And, you know, they love coming to a dental school because it's like everything's very slow. You take your time. You have like really good consultants and supervisors. So it was just amazing and really fulfilling. And I was like, I'm so glad I made this choice because I didn't I didn't truly know what I was getting into until I got there, which is a bit tricky for people who are applying now because it's a bit of a gamble. But I was definitely one of those where I was, once I started dental school, I started loving it even more. And I was like, initially, the reasons I did it were for the work life balance and the financial reward and kind of the lifestyle. But then as I got into it, I was like, wow, the work is also such a reward and such a benefit. And it kind of everything started to come together a little bit. Yeah. Um, King's itself, uh, it's quite, it's the biggest dental school, I think, in the UK, which comes with its downsides as well as its good stuff. Um, I don't know how it is at other dental schools, but if you just look at the numbers in general, we're probably double the size of a normal dental school would be, a year group. Um, and which means that a lot of uh, your clinical experience and even your education is quite self-directed and quite independent, which is fine if that's something that you thrive upon. And, and a lot of people don't like being patronized or keeping or having their hand held. And as a grad, especially that kind of appeals to me because I feel like, okay, I know what I need to do now. I need to go away and do it myself. Um, other people, I think, especially maybe people who come straight from school and maybe an environment where like the teacher kind of tells you what you need to do every step yeah. of the way, they might feel that they need a smaller kind of class number or, or environment where, you know, it's a lot more close one-to-one -one sort of teaching. Uh, at King's, you won't get one-to-one -one teaching as such. You'll kind of have like, you know, groups of maybe six or seven to one tutor on mm -hmm. clinic, if that makes sense. So it's kind of weighing up stuff. You also have, at King's, you have access to so many amazing clinicians, so many consultants, so many opinions. So you can really throw yourself in there and learn so much, but you have to take the initiative rather than someone approaching you. Um, what's the dynamic of um, living in London, mm. um, studying at King's and also trying to do um, other things outside of dentistry. How does that all work together? Okay. Um, I think it's very feasible. Um, I think on the London front, uh, so I, I, I feel like I can offer an opinion on this because I am someone who has lived outside of London. So I know cost of living relative to London. I feel like Londoners obviously just kind of don't necessarily have much to compare it to, but mm. Yeah, London, everyone outside of London also is always like, London's so expensive, London's so expensive. It is expensive, but also if you're sensible, you, you, you can make it work quite comfortably. Like, um, you get student finance, which also increases the amount that you will get because you're in London. It kind of accounts for that fact. And then in terms of other things, like if, you're, if you are struggling, then your universities tend to have a hardship fund, which you can access uh, and apply for. And they're quite generous with it. Um, I found that both at Imperial and at King's, it didn't matter which, what the uni was, both of them were happy to help you out if you needed the help. Um, and to be honest, I wouldn't say the majority of students need that help either. I think student mm -hmm. finance, you know, it's tight, but it's not, it's not uncomfortable. Um, if you're sensible with your spending, and if anything, it teaches you that skill of budgeting and learning how to manage your finances, which is something that everyone needs to be learn, to learn mm -hmm. how to do. Um, so in, on that front, you know, you, you can lived like comfortably you know even though you're in london it's just that everything in increases proportionally so the more you get more funding but your cost of living is also higher yeah um, was cost of living the, the only major thing that changed for you um transport and um yeah relating to people did, was that any different so i think rent and transport are the two biggest um 
expenses obviously that you'll have living in London as a student um, with transport you can you need to again think of it like quite smartly so I, I remember when I first got to Imperial from Leicester I was like spending I was topping up my Oyster card almost every other day I buy about 20 to 30 quid and I was like wow I can't carry this through the year because I'll be I'll be literally run out of money by the end of the first couple of months but then obviously someone introduced me to travel cards and linking that with your rail card and there's lots of ways to kind of save money as a student Get, getting a student Oyster gets you a discount on monthly travel cards so you work out things that make it cheaper for you overall, but these are all things that you kind of find out along the way. Yeah. Um, and um, so again, yeah, made it manageable. Um, in terms of people in London, it's great. It's so diverse that like, I think for me, uh, I went to a school that wasn't perhaps the most diverse, it, kind of in, in a remote area of Leicester. Um, and coming to London, you just find people from like abroad, internationals, uh, people from your own background, um, and there's also at university, there's just so many different bubbles that you can kind of tune into. Like, mm. you know, I play cricket, so obviously I can get involved with that side of things at uni. But there's also other things like politics, things outside of dentistry. And I really encourage people to kind of broaden their horizons. Like uh, I used to write for the newspaper, the, the student newspaper as well. Like it, it, it really is, uh, university is like the best time to kind of throw yourself into almost anything that you've ever wanted to try because it's all there. Most, most of the time it's, it's either really really cheap or it's free to do that kind of stuff at uni so i would definitely say just throw yourself into it in, in terms of accommodation did you choose somewhere that was really close to the dental school or how, how did you go about um so at king's i was a little bit lucky so because i was a grad um and also because my parents actually the year i got into dental school my parents actually moved from leicester back to london which was right. very very convenient it wasn't just for me it was just because you know, they felt like it was the right time. So I actually ended up commuting from home. So I saved in terms on rent in terms of that regard. But at Imperial, I did live out for three years. And um, for the first year, usually what happens is undergraduates get halls um, in, in pretty much every union. I know King's is the same. Um, those halls can be kind of dotted around the place, but they tend to be close to campus, which obviously makes it easier for you as a first year just to get familiar with everything. And in terms of pricing as well, they also have staggered pricing. So you can kind of find... Uh, a room that kind of suits your your overall budget mm. then kind of second year till final year that's when you start to kind of because you've made your friends at this point you can like find private accommodation with them there are still places available at king's i remember in in the student first year halls where old years can kind of take the spare rooms that the undergrads haven't taken up but i think the problem with that is it can get quite isolating because you're no longer a first year amongst first years you're kind of like an older year living with first years which can be a little bit kind of awkward if that makes sense so most people find their own flat um in terms of kings the area it can be a little bit tricky because obviously it's the guys campus is in london bridge which is quite an expensive and corporate environment but you know if you move like 10 15 minutes down the road you've got bermondsey oval um uh, borough so these are all places that kind of do offer student accommodation and are, are a bit more affordable and they're only 10, 10 minutes walk from campus mm. so in that regard um you know i didn't i wouldn't say people struggle for accommodation um it's just that you need to le know to look in the right areas because i feel like a lot of people can get ripped off otherwise what's the um proportion of undergrad students so students that came straight from college of sixth form yeah at entry students and international students how, how does that work out in each cohort so let, let, let's talk from year two onwards because grad entry would be jumping yeah. up from year two yeah so i couldn't tell you how many pure undergraduates from school there are obviously i would say the majority are that kind of student um in terms of graduate entries you have i'd say about 15 to 20 in each year group that are graduate entry um and then internationals, I wouldn't say there's, I, I wouldn't say there's a, a massive proportion of internationals. Um, couldn't give you a number, but I'd probably say, you know, similar amounts to maybe the grad students um, number. Yeah. Um, they, they, I think they also have a cap on the amount of international students that they can accommodate for each year because you're, the international students don't necessarily compete against the UK students. It's kind of like they have their own like quota, if that makes sense, That's of international it. students per year group. Yeah. Um, even mixed in the undergraduates so the ones that come from school you actually have people 
who are grads like me, but they didn't get onto a grad program. So they get into the undergraduate version of mm -hmm. dentistry. So amongst those people who are on the undergraduate program that are from school, there's also quite a, a significant proportion that are people who have already done degrees, but they're on the undergraduate five-year program. Um, and then another interesting thing is that at King's, in your third year, you get an additional five to 10 students who are doctors doing a three-year uh, accelerated yeah. program. So even more uh, fast track than the four-year graduate program. Um, those are kind of the, the doctors who want to become maxillofacial surgeons. So they have to do both degrees. So at King's, you kind of had them thrown into the mix as well. So what is their experience? Actually, that, that's quite an interesting one. Um, yeah. Not many dental schools offer the three-year accelerated. No, they don't. What is the experience uh, of the, the medics who jump onto dentistry? Yeah, I couldn't tell you honestly, because obviously I haven't, I haven't been in, my, in that situation myself, but from speaking to a few of them, it's such a, a steep learning curve for them. It's, they're almost like thrown into the deep end and because they're doctors, <laughs> they're expected just to kind of not, you know, not crack and just stay under pressure. But a lot of them, I think, just feel quite out of their depth until maybe final year where they start to put things together and they're kind of a bit more confident. But I think they go in with that kind of, that they accept that reality because they're like, look, we're trying to do something that's, you know, a five-year program in three years. Um, and they also tend to go into a more medical side of things after dental school. So they're not necessarily going out into practice doing dental procedures every single day. They kind of just need the knowledge as well as some kind of manual dexterity to kind of perform those procedures. Do they get that support then to, to get up to speed with the practical skills or are they just given a bit of a pass on the practical element of dentistry? No, I, no, no. I feel like they have to still get to that same standard as everyone else. They're assessed to the same standard. Um, they have like, at King's anyway, they have like a, a, about a month or two private kind of training before everyone else starts. So they'll have maybe groups and it's, it's really small group teaching in that sense. So one of the like, one of the top professors will take maybe, you know, the cohort of, we call them DPMGs, which is just basically for a name for the medical uh, graduates. He, he, uh, the professors will take them for like a month or two and get them up to speed or as, as best they can. Um, and then they kind of push them out into the, the general kind of cohort. Yeah. Um, but, but that's the kind of main support that they have. And then they're kind of assessed just the same as everyone else. So it yeah. is a very steep learning curve. It's very interesting. Um, could you get dentistry into a three-year course? Yeah, that's the, that's the debate. Um, it's, it's a very tricky one. I mean, I found four years doable, um, but it was the first year. The, the, the thing is, the theory does take time to kind of learn and consolidate and i think that's the reason it's the it's the length that it is because we it's not like it's five years of clinical experience it's like mainly it's probably like three years of clinical experience if not two and a half years because your your first year on clinics is a little bit kind of slow yeah. uh, at king's anyway so it, it, it's more the it's more the consolidation um it's more the consolidation of of that knowledge that takes a long time yeah um yeah and just um, just round off this segment, um, what advice would you give to people considering um, dentistry um, as a career, um, dental school, applying to dental school? What what overall uh, message would, would would you give to to somebody in that position? Uh, applying to dental school, I think um, don't write yourself off before uh, too early. Basically, I think that even with me, there was a point where I was like, oh, my UCAT isn't high enough should I even apply to Kings? And, you know, at the end of the day, they were the ones that were the only school to offer me. And, and I could have maybe missed out on that if I'd kind of ruled myself out. So I think there's, there's, for me, I was like, I think it was easier for me as a grad because I had that comfort blanket of a degree behind me. But I was like, right, what do I want in a perfect scenario? I want to get into the graduate program at Kings. And so I kind of made peace with that. And I was like, well, that's what I really want. So I'm going to apply for that. At least one of my four choices will be the one that I really, really want to. And that way I, I haven't kind of ruled out that possibility, even if the odds are stacked against me. Mm. Um, people might feel that they're in the same situation in terms of their grades at, un at school. They feel like, oh, maybe I don't have the right grades for dental school. I'm not predicted high enough. I would say just, you know, the, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, you don't get in, but that was going to happen if you ruled yourself out anyway. So why not have a go? And then if it doesn't happen, you know, take a year out, you know, maybe retake some exams, get some experience, try and diversify a little bit, but mm. have a go in the first place um, and then see what happens. I think that's my main sort of piece of advice. 
if people want to connect with you or find out about your book, what's the best way for people to, to do that? Um, so I've got an Instagram account, which I'm quite active on. It's uh, Dr. Zane Rizvi, which is my name. Um, alternatively, they can obviously get in touch with me on Facebook or, or uh, via email, which is, again, just my name, Zane Rizvi at hotmail.com. Um, but I'm probably most active in terms of dentally on Instagram. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that's the best way they can get in touch. Fantastic. Thank you for that.